All right, so if we rewind the clock and we go back to where we were on Friday, we ended Friday with this particular slide asking this particular question. If I'm doing a reaction in aqueous solution, how do I know that a reaction is actually occurring? Because after all, if I have one solution that's full of ions and another solution that is full of ions and I put them together, how do I know that I don't have a just more, a more complicated mixture of ions? Well, the way to approach that is we look for some telltale markers. And you know what those markers are. They're the kinds of things that we look for for any chemical change, heat, light, solid formation, gas formation, those kinds of things. But that's not what we're really interested in here. What we're interested in more is on the chemical level, on the molecular level, what is going on and what allows us to tell that something is actually different. And so with these kinds of double replacement reactions, again, these are double replacement. If we're talking about two aqueous solutions being put together, we're talking about a double replacement reaction of some sort. And we can break this down into two primary areas. There are the precipitation reactions and the acid-base reactions. The first type, precipitation reactions, are ones that form precipitates. By definition, a precipitate is a solid product formed from a reaction that occurs in solution. In other words, they are the insoluble product of soluble reactants. I put one solution together with another, I get a solid that forms out. That solid does not dissolve in water. So common example of this, I've got silver nitrate in solution, reacting with sodium chloride in solution. And the result I get is sodium nitrate in solution and silver chloride, which comes out in the form of a solid. So I put this liquid in with this one and a white solid comes out as a result. That's our evidence of a chemical reaction. How do we know what the identity of that product is? That's where our solubility rules come in. That's why we focus on those solubility rules so much because I should be able to look at this and say, okay, sodium and nitrate are both on the first list that are always soluble. So that white solid can't be the sodium nitrate. It must be the silver chloride. And does that fit with what we know about chlorides? Yeah. Chlorides are usually soluble. Well, everybody except for Merle's chlorides. Mercury, lead, silver. Silver is one of them. Now, these precipitation reactions can be written using net ionic equations. And we'll get to what that looks like in a second. But the general idea is that by the time I get to the end of this, I'm gonna have a reason why this formed and evidence to show that a chemical reaction, a chemical change did take place molecularly, not just based on our observations. In acid-base reactions, what we have going on there is something called a neutralization. In a neutralization, we are talking about an acid solution reacting with a base solution of some kind and giving us, as a result, water and some kind of ionic compound or more generally stated, a salt. Now, as far as identification is concerned. Observationally speaking, acid-based identification for reactions are a lot more difficult because in many cases, take a look at the example problem here. My products here are not solids. They're not gases. So for all intents and purposes, 
this reaction is going to look pretty much the same before and after. Because hydrochloric acid, clear colorless solution, sodium hydroxide, clear and colorless solution. Sodium chloride dissolves completely in water, makes a clear colorless solution. Water, well, it's water. Water is clear and colorless. So all of the products and all of the reactants all look the same. How do I identify a chemical reaction has occurred? Again, that's where a net ionic equation is going to come in. It's going to help us to figure out what is happening when our observations seem to tell us that nothing is happening. Now, in the case of most neutralization reactions, we usually see this accompanied with a temperature change. So if I paid close attention, if I did this with a thermometer in the, in the flask or whatever, there's a good chance I'd see a slight spike in the temperature as the reaction occurred. I could also evaluate things like pH or um, uh, conductivity and use those as perspectives as well to evaluate whether or not a reaction is occurring if things are changing as the two are coming together. But again, our primary point here is that when it comes to evaluating reactions at the molecular level, simply viewing a balanced chemical equation is often not sufficient for telling us the true story of what is going on inside of that reaction vessel. Because when it comes to those aqueous solutions, we're not dealing with a pure substance anymore. We're dealing with a mixture. It's water and something else. And so I can't even do little things like measure out volume or mass and use that to figure out how much copper sulfate I have. I have to use things like concentration to get to that spot. So instead of molecular equations, which tend to focus on big, broad issues, this plus this gives me products. What we're going to focus on instead are what are called ionic equations. And ionic equations are two things. First of all, they're a little bit more accurate. And the reason we can say that they are a little bit more accurate is because they give us the true identity of what is going on in that solution. In a molecular equation, you might have something that looks like this. NaCl aqueous. And if you weren't careful, you might think that that means that there are a bunch of NaCl formula units just kind of floating around in that solution. But that's not reality. We know that the hydrogen bonds in water are going to pull apart that crystal and actually give us sodium ions in solution and chloride ions in solution. This is the more accurate way of stating what is actually present in that sodium chloride solution. And that's what ionic equations do. Ionic equations tell us what is present in that solution at that particular time and gives us the most accurate kind of viewpoint from that perspective. So it's not sodium chloride units floating around. It's sodium units and chloride units separated that are floating around in that solution. And when we view aqueous chemistry from that ionic perspective, it becomes a lot more simple, a lot more easy for us to tell whether or not something actually changed, whether or not something occurred. Because 
if I break it down to an ionic perspective and all the ions that were present at the beginning are present at the end in the same form that they were before, then I know that nothing changed. But if I see rearrangements, if I see the formation of solids or gases or pure liquids out of those ionic building blocks, then I know that something did change. I know that a chemical reaction actually did occur. And that's what an ionic equation allows me to do. Now to use ionic equations, we need to be very intimately familiar with our solubility rules. We need to know when things are strong electrolytes and when things are not strong electrolytes. That is going to be the defining factor in making our ionic solution or our ionic equation rather. So this is described as a four step process. Um, each of these steps kind of has sub steps in them. Uh, Honestly, the best way to go through them is, we'll walk through the rules here, but we're gonna do several examples because the only way that you really get good at this is you keep practicing. So step one, write the molecular equation. And I'm gonna add one thing to that. If your molecular equation is not balanced, it's useless. Now we harped on that in chapter seven, talking about stoichiometry and making sure that we had our mole to mole ratios correct. What we'll find is that if we do not balance our molecular equations here, they are going to be almost impossible to turn into net ionic equations because they're not going to cancel out the correct way. So balance your equations. Make sure that you got all your formulas right. Make sure that you've got it balanced before you move on. So once we've got that balanced molecular equation, second thing that we do is we identify each of the reacting species. And we identify them based into one of those six groups that we talked about in, the, in that solubility rules proficiency. Strong acid, strong base. Weak acid, weak base. Soluble salt, insoluble salt. One of those six. Again, this is where you gotta know your solubility rules. This is where you gotta be able to identify acids and bases correctly and know, know your strongs from your weaks. Once we've done that, everything that is in the strong electrolyte category, so all of the markers that begin with S's, strong acid, strong base, soluble salt, those ones get broken apart into ions. We split them up. Everything else stays in its molecular formula. So if it's a weak acid, it stays as the molecularized weak acid. It does not split into ions. If it's a weak base, it stays molecularized. If it's a pure liquid or a pure solid, so we identify it as an insoluble salt, we identify it as water or a pure gas like carbon dioxide that we know does not ionize, we leave it in its molecular form. And so this becomes the basis of our ionic equation. Everything that's a strong electrolyte gets broken apart. Everything that is not a strong electrolyte stays together. 
we'll come back to this slide in just a minute. Let's, let's look at an example first. And then we'll come back to just talk about net ionics after. So with this first example, we've got lead to nitrate reacting with sodium iodide to make sodium nitrate and lead to iodide. Now, our first step was to write the balanced molecular equation. Anyone see any issues with what's written on the board here as far as balancing or correct formulas? No, it's, it's all right. So step one, check it off. We got it. Step two, identify each of the reacting species into one of those six categories. So lead to nitrate, how would we classify lead to nitrate? When I'm faced with this kind of problem, I want to get it into even odds quick. What I mean by that is I should be able to identify any of these as acid, base, or salt almost immediately. If it doesn't start with hydrogen, it's not an acid. If it doesn't end with hydroxide, it's not a base. And since this is neither of those, this must be a salt. So I've got a salt. Is it soluble or insoluble? Okay, I'm hearing both. The correct answer is soluble. Right, Kelly, were you talking? Was that you? Why do you say soluble? All right, nitrates are on the soluble list. Again, if you find something that's on the soluble list, end the conversation right there. It's soluble. Doesn't matter what it's attached to. Okay, sodium iodide. Soluble or insoluble? Again, doesn't start with hydrogen, doesn't end with hydroxide, so it's a salt. Okay, why this time, Kelly? Right. Sodium salts, any of the group one salts, they're soluble as well. Now, using that same logic, sodium nitrate on the product side, I've got sodium, which is always soluble, nitrate, which is always soluble, it's soluble as well. So soluble salt, soluble salt, soluble salt. Three for three so far. All right, lead to iodide. All right, this one is insoluble. Now remember, bromides and iodides follow the same rules as chlorides. Lead is one of Merle's chlorides. So lead would be insoluble. So I've identified all four. The last step in the ionic making process is to break these apart into their ions. So I've got the lead two ion, Pb plus two. I've got... The nitrate ion, NO3 minus. Okay, important point here. Probably one of the biggest mistakes that students make is assuming that subscripts like these indicate that that is the ion itself. I will tell you, that I, I will see probably about a third of you at some point either on a quiz, a proficiency, an exam, do something like this for the ionic equation. What I'm gonna point to you, what I'm gonna jump up and down and say is where on our, any of your ion sheets that we've done at any point in the semester, have you seen anything that looked like that? Parentheses do not belong in ions. The only time we see parentheses 
are to balance charges in compounds. So what does that two mean? It doesn't mean that I've got an NO3 two ion of some kind. What that means is that I've got two NO3 minus ions. I've got two nitrate ions there. One lead two plus, two nitrate ions. That is what that is telling us. So when you see subscripts in that particular spot, that's where they go. Bring them to the outside, turn them into coefficients. When you see coefficients as part of the balanced chemical equation, remember that that distributes. So I have two sodium ions and two iodide ions as a result. Two sodium iodides mean two sodium ions, two iodide ions in, in the reaction. Okay, <clears throat> on the flip side, <clears throat> same deal here. We've got a coefficient of two that distributes. So two sodium ions, two nitrate ions. And then the last one here led to iodide. That one is insoluble, so it does not break apart. We keep it together, P, B, I2. So this, this is my ionic equation. Everything is represented as accurately as possible according to what is in those solutions. The lead to nitrate solution doesn't have lead to nitrate molecules. It has lead to ions and nitrate ions in it. The sodium iodide solution doesn't have sodium iodide molecules in it. It has sodium ions and iodide ions. And the product has a precipitate led to iodide and a solution of, of uh, sodium ions and nitrate ions. Now, what you might notice in your ionic equations here is that there tends to be a lot of extra. There tends to be a lot of filler. I can look at this and see that, hey, look, I've got sodium ion on both sides and I've got nitrate ion on both sides as well. Both present in the same quantities on both sides of the reaction. These are what are known as spectator ions. Spectator ions are ions in solution that during a chemical reaction do nothing. They're called spectators because like spectators at a sporting event or spectators at a musical or a play, they sit around and watch. They're not actually participants in the event. And so from that perspective, spectator ions aren't generally all that interesting to us. And since they don't actually participate in the reaction, and so, A lot of times it is not to include. A net ionic equation 
takes on the task of removing those spectator ions to allow us to see the true reaction. So what actually took place? What changed in this reaction? And so from that perspective, if I took those spectator ions out and just drew what was left, I would have lead two plus ion, two iodide ions to make the lead two iodide solid. In this chemical reaction, this is what happened. The lead ion reacted with the iodide ions to make the precipitate lead to iodide. Everything else that was present there was really just for show. I would get a similar kind of reaction if I had used lead to acetate and potassium iodide because the, lead, the acetate and the potassium would have done the same thing. Sat around and watched. This particular phenomenon happens very often where we'll see that ions are common to both sides of the equation. Again, we call those ions that are common to both sides of the equation spectator ions. And removing them from the ionic equation turns our ionic equation into what we call a net ionic equation. The net ionic equation just gives us what changed? And the footnote here is super important. If by the time we get through the ionic equation and all we see are spectator ions, then we know for certain that a reaction did not occur. This is what allows us to look at the difference between a neutralization reaction that has no observable changes necessarily with a reaction that didn't have anything at all, where we just made one big ionic solution as a result. Any questions so far? All right, let's do another example. All right, in this case, I've got silver nitrate reacting with potassium chloride to make silver chloride and potassium nitrate. Okay, we've got our molecular equation. Is it balanced? Pure so. So step one complete. Step two, we've got to identify these. We've got to break them off into groups. Would any of these classify as acid or base? No hydrogens. No hydroxides. So we're talking about salts here. We just got to use our solubility rules to figure out if they're soluble or not soluble. All right. Silver nitrate. Uh, again, nitrates are always soluble. So this is a soluble salt, SS. Potassium chloride. Chlorides are usually soluble. The only ones that aren't are Merle's chlorides. Um, potassium is not one of those. And potassium is in group one, which is always soluble. 
Once again, we come to a chloride. Um, mercury, lead, and silver are the exceptions. Silver would be this one, so it's insoluble. Potassium nitrate, I've got a group one and a nitrate. Soluble, soluble. So I've got everything I need now. I just need to break it into pieces. Now, since the stoichiometry here is considerably simpler, there are no twos, there are no extra subscripts, this ionic equation is going to be a lot more simple than the first one was. I've got silver ion, Ag+, plus, reacting with nitrate ion, NO3-, minus, reacting with potassium ion, K+, plus, and chloride ion, Cl-, minus, to make silver chloride, AgCl, and potassium ion, and nitrate ion. So there's my ionic equation. Not too difficult, this one. Again, once you, once you break it up, once you know what to look for, once you're familiar enough with the solubility rules that you got some confidence with it, this part's not too bad. It's just knowing what to do with it, what to do with that information. So there's my ionic equation. Are there any spectator ions? All right, somebody name one for me, Ben. Potassium's one, okay, so let's circle that. Uh, anyone else? Um, yeah, go ahead. The yeah, the nitrates. All right. So those are our spectators. So the net ionic equation would take those out. It would just be the silver ion plus the chloride ion, making the silver chloride solid. That's really all that there is to it, this one. All right, any questions with this example? All right, try this one yourself. Molecular equation is balanced. We're talking about the reaction of ammonium sulfate with barium chloride to make barium sulfate and ammonium chloride. So walk through the process. We've already balanced the equation. So step one's done. Identify, break it into ions and convert it to the net. Okay, walking around, most of you, your head's in the right spot. Couple of little things to point out. Little things that'll save you big points. First of all, make sure you've got your charges right. It's real easy to fall into the trap of something like barium sulfate here and say, okay, well, it's barium plus one and sulfate minus one. It's also real easy to do things like this. What's wrong with that? Okay, even if I had the two here, there's no charges. Ionic equations have to be ionic. You have to give me ions here. So 
in your hurry to be correct, make sure that you're also being precise. So the ammonium should have a positive one charge, the sulfate a negative two, the barium a positive two, the chloride a negative one. On the flip side, the barium sulfate is your insoluble product. Again, Balcomer's sulfates are insoluble. And you'd have two ammonium ions and two chloride ions. And so you should identify your ammonium and your chloride as your spectators. Uh, another real quick note there. If you don't have the same number and kind, they don't actually cancel out. So if you only had one ammonium over here and two over in the products, they didn't actually cancel out. All that would happen there is this one would cancel. This one would lose its two, but that's all that would happen. In order for them to cancel, in order for them to be truly spectators, they have to be in agreement in number and kind. So last part here, get it into the net. It's sulfate ion plus barium ion to make barium sulfate. All right, thank you for your attention this morning. Uh, post lecture should help you get some extra practice in uh, we'll do one more example on Friday before we get into redox as well. Have a good afternoon.